Today we're doing the depth of field video, the one that I've alluded to a couple times before, and the one that I hope will be a once and for all explanation that removes any confusion and debate on the subject. Let's get undone. What is happening, everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and today we're talking about depth of field. Now, I'm making this video for the same reasons that I made the previous video on f-stop and apertures, because there's a lot of misinformation about this topic, and because I know you guys like this stuff. But more importantly with this topic, I think that this whole depth of field conversation and the misunderstandings that go along with it have been negatively impacting many people's opinions on their own gear and needs as a photographer and videographer. And ultimately, the most important reason to learn anything about creative technology is to use it to your advantage when it comes to time to create. So first up, what is depth of field or DOF? Well, depth of field is a range of distances around a specific plane of focus that are also acceptably in focus. Now we say acceptably in focus because only that specific plane is truly in focus, but the range around it that is sharp enough to seem reasonably in focus or where you can't really tell the difference is what comprises your depth of field. And this range is formed in front and behind of the subject. And if you have a lot of it, your field is deep, and if you don't have a lot of it, your field is shallow. Also, I'm gonna be talking about the entrance pupil and the diameter of the entrance pupil a lot in this video. And when I do, I'm referring to the aperture as it's seen when looking through the front of the lens. If this is confusing or doesn't mean much to you, I highly recommend you go and watch my previous video before continuing because it thoroughly explains how the diameter of the entrance pupil is more important than the diameter of the aperture when it comes to calculations like these. So if you wanna pause this video here and go check that one out, it's no problem at all. I'll just entertain the rest of the viewers with magic tricks while we wait for you to get back. Okay, so now that we have our footing with the terms, let's move on to the misconceptions about depth of field. So in short, Despite anything else you might have heard, there are only two things that directly affect your depth of field. The first is your distance to the subject, and the second is the diameter of your entrance pupil. Now, I'm putting the emphasis on directly here because that's where most of the confusion comes from. I mean, you might even have first-hand experience that tells you that when you change focal lengths, your depth of field appears to be different. And in fact, in the past, I've even included that in previous videos in order to keep the explanation simple because it's not exactly incorrect if you say that your focal length is indirectly affecting your depth of field. And this also goes for sensor size, which is another huge item of debate that people are always saying that your sensor size affects your depth of field. But again, it doesn't directly affect your depth of field, only indirectly. So by that admission, yes, there are also three other indirect factors that affect depth of field, which of course are your f-stop, your focal length, and your sensor size. There's also some bizarre tertiary factors that can affect depth of field, but there's very little point in spending any time on them in this video because they are functionally unimportant. Okay, so let's give a quick explanation as to why the two direct factors affect depth of field so that the other indirect reasons can fall into place. We're talking about distance to subject and the diameter of the entrance pupil. Now the illustration that I like to use to explain how this works is a classic of optics, the crossing lines. Light rays need to be converged in order to be brought into focus, and the point where they meet is where the point of true focus is that we were talking about earlier, that plane of focus. And the zone where the lines aren't too far apart, that's our range of acceptable focus or our depth of field. And this is a perfect time to answer Steve's question from the comments of the last video where he asked what exactly focal length is because it's basically the distance that it takes for this process to happen. So if a lens takes 50 millimeters for parallel rays to be converged into a single point and you measure the distance from when the rays are first bent until they actually converge and that distance is 50 millimeters, you have a 50 millimeter lens. That's why people say a 50 millimeter lens is a 50 millimeter lens, whether it's on full frame, micro four thirds, or APS-C, because it doesn't change based on the sensor size of the camera, it's based on how long it takes that lens to converge those rays. What's actually changing between those lenses is their angle of view, not their converging power. And if you wanna know more about angle of view and crop factor, check out my video on that, which I'll put up at the end screen of this video and also in the description below. Anyway, good question, Steve. All right, so let's use this illustration to explain how depth of field can change. Now we're gonna oversimplify the optics here and just focus on the convergence of rays. But if you picture the rays coming into our lens after perfectly converging on our subject, we'll be able to establish our depth of field. Now this illustration is a bit wonky because this convergence actually occurs inside the lens, but I assure you the practicality of this explanation is the same. Now let's say that for this imaginary lens and distance combination that our depth of field is here. 
This means that any time the rays are this close together, they'll be acceptably in focus, because we can't tell the difference in sharpness between the rays that are this close together and this close together or this close together. They all look equally sharp to us. But if they're this far apart, we can tell the difference and they start to look blurry. So the distance between these two cutoff points of where we can and can't tell the difference that's our depth of field. Well, now we can manipulate this illustration to show how the distance to the subject affects our depth of field, because if we get closer to the subject, the rays converge more sharply, giving us a shorter range where the rays are that same closeness together. So remember, when they're that close together, that's when they're acceptably in focus, and when they're this far apart, it's blurry and we can tell the difference. So when the rays converge more sharply, they're closer together for less distance, that range, the cutoff points are now closer together. That's why when the subject is closer to the lens or the lens closer to the subject, you have a more shallow depth of field. And the same is true if we increase or decrease the size of our entrance pupil. When the size of our entrance pupil gets wider, then the rays again will converge more sharply, which is gonna give us a shorter range where they're actually close together, and so our depth of field is gonna be more shallow. But if our entrance pupil was much smaller, then the rays are gonna converge much more easily, giving us a much greater distance between our cutoff points and a much deeper depth of field. Now these two methods are the only true ways of affecting your depth of field. Everything else is just a secondary method of affecting those two primary factors. An easy example of one of these secondary factors would be your aperture or your f-stop, because like I explained in the previous video, when your aperture gets larger, the diameter of your entrance pupil gets larger. And when your entrance pupil is larger, the rays converge more sharply, thus giving you a more shallow depth of field. But now what about sensor size? Well sensor size really has no impact on your depth of field, I mean how could it? It's just sort of the thing that captures the information. It doesn't change your distance to the subject or anything, but it may indirectly cause you to get closer or farther away from your subject because of a thing called the crop factor. In order to achieve the same framing on a micro four thirds camera as you would on a full frame camera if you're using the same focal length, you'll have to get twice as far away because a micro four thirds camera has a two times crop. And as we know from the illustration, the further you are from your subject, the more easily the rays converge and thus the deeper your depth of field. So the only way to compensate and keep the framing the same is to use a lens with half the focal length. But if you do that, you'll still have a deeper depth of field. But if you think about the rest of the compensation that takes place, because in order to achieve the same depth of field, now that we have our framing the same using half of the focal length, we also have to divide our f-stop by two. So if you were using a 50 millimeter lens at 2.8 on full frame, you'd have to use a 25 millimeter lens at f1.4 on micro four thirds. So you're dividing both by two, the 50 millimeter and the 2.8. And if you remember from the previous video on f-stops and apertures, you'll know that the f number is actually just a ratio of focal length to diameter of the entrance pupil. So with that, we can quickly see that all we're really trying to do is make equal size entrance pupils between the full frame and the micro four thirds systems. Let's do some quick math and I'll show you what I mean. So let's say that we were using a 50 millimeter lens f4 on full frame. Well that means 50 millimeters divided by four is gonna give us the diameter of our entrance pupil, which is 12.5, 50 divided by four. And as we were just talking about, if we want to achieve the same angle of view on a micro four thirds system, we're gonna to have to use a 25 millimeter lens. But if the 25 millimeter lens was also set to f4, then the diameter of the entrance pupil is gonna be 25 divided by four, it's only gonna be 6.25 millimeters, which is half the size of the entrance pupil on that full frame lens we just described. Which is why it's gonna be a deeper depth of field because that smaller entrance pupil means that the rays are gonna converge more easily, giving us a greater distance where the rays are close enough together that we can't tell the difference and it's an acceptable focus. So in order to create the same depth of field, what do we do? Well, we have to affect our f-stop by the same crop factor, which means dividing it by two as well. So we go from f4 down to f2. And then if we apply the same formula, 25 millimeters this time, divided by two for the f-stop of two, we're gonna have an entrance pupil diameter of 12.5 millimeters, the same diameter as it was on the 50 millimeter f4 lens that we were using on the full frame camera. So really all these settings are trying to do is create equal diameters of entrance pupil. So it's not the aperture or the focal length or the sensor size that affects depth of field, but it's the combination of these things that require you to compensate in order to either create an equal entrance pupil diameter, or in order to get the same distance from the subject, 
to achieve that depth of field. Now the last two details I want to cover when it comes to focal length is the bad methodology out there that leads to silly results. In example one, you'll see the tester standing in a fixed position, taking a photo of a subject that's also in a fixed position, and then they'll switch to a wider lens and compare and they'll say that the depth of field is shallower on their longer lens. Without changing your aperture, you can actually create that shot with the same depth of field just by framing the subject the same way. But that's why those tests are silly, because the tester always stands in the same position and switches lenses. But that's, that doesn't make any sense, that the shot isn't the same. So achieve the same shot, all they would have to do is get closer. If they get close enough, that the subject occupies the same amount of the frame as they did when they were standing further away and using a longer lens, the depth of field would be exactly the same. And these equivalencies is what proves that it's not focal length that affects your depth of field, but how focal length indirectly either affects the size of your entrance pupil or makes you have to get closer or further away from your subject, the only two true things that affect your depth of field. Now the second focal length myth is about the background. Whenever you use a lens with a longer focal length, those background bits always seem larger and more creamier, which makes people think that their focal length is what's affecting their depth of field. But again, this is just an illusion because longer lenses make things appear closer, including the blurry bits in the background. Now I'm not suggesting there's no difference between focal lengths because longer focal lengths can definitely give you a more pleasing bokeh or better separation from the background, which can be sought after when it comes to portraits. But if we took that same photo with a wider lens and then just zoomed in on the background, we would see that those background bits are actually equally sharp or equally out of focus regardless of what focal length that you were using. Which means the depth of field wasn't altered, just the magnification of the out-of-focus parts. Now there's a great resource you can use both in the browser and also as an app for your phone or your tablet and it's called DOF Simulator. And basically what it lets you do is put in your sensor size, your focal length, your f-stop and your distance to the subject and it'll calculate your depth of field for you. Now this is great for figuring out what lens and aperture combination you might want to use and at what distance to avoid those unfortunate situations where you've got like one eye in focus and the other eye out of focus, etc. But you can also use it to test the things that I was telling you about in this video. So for example, I said that a wide wider lens would have an equal depth of field if the subject took up the same size in the frame. So let's test that. So here we've got a full frame sensor and let's set it to 50 millimeters because I think that's what I said in the test and we'll set it to an aperture of 2.8 and let's set our subject to be two meters away or 200 centimeters. And then we can see over here and, and we can also change uh, the background and stuff like that. So if I wanted to change it from Paris to a tree, there we go. So now we can get a rough idea of what our image would look like. This is our subject and then this is our background. And then we can see down here what our depth of field is. It's 25.4 centimeters. And then over here it says in front of the subject is 11.9 centimeters and behind the subject is 13.5. So it's the total amount that's going to be acceptably in focus is going to be 25 centimeters with a certain amount. So say you were focusing on the eye, then you're going to be able to get 13.5 centimeters behind the eye in focus and 11.9 centimeters in front of the eye in focus. That's your depth of field. So now let's change it to a 25 millimeter lens. So we can just click add down here, which is going to save the settings we just had. And then we'll change this to 25 millimeters, but we'll leave the f-stop the same, but we can see clearly that the subject is much further away now. Now all I said was that if we make the subject the same size, which is going to be that we're going to have to go down to one meter, because if the focal length is half the size, we're going to have to get twice as close, right? So at one meter away, 25 millimeter, still at f2.8, we can take a look at our depth of field, which is coming in at 25.7 centimeters. Now we'll add this one as well so that we can switch back and forth quickly and we can see that the subject is taking up the same size in the frame. We do notice, however, that the tree in the background is getting closer and farther away because like, like I was saying before, that's a magnification. The, everything's getting closer when you use a longer lens. But if we look at the depth of field, it's 25.7 and 25.4. Now I realize that it's not precisely the same, but like I said, there's small tertiary differences that can also affect depth of field, but for practical applications, that's the same depth of field. And all we had to do was get a little bit closer. Now the other thing that I said was that if we would have just zoomed in on the background that the out of focus parts would actually have been equally sharp just some are closer. Now if we look at the 25 millimeter here and we see how blurry if you want to call it the tree bits are and then we look at those same tree bits here, they're actually the same amount out of focus. The tree is just closer in the 50 millimeter lens. So in summary, does aperture, focal length and sensor size affect your depth of field? Yes, but only because they either change the size of the entrance pupil or require you to change your distance to your subject. The only true two factors that actually change your depth of field. Anyway, that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. All right, I'm done. <laughs>